Hey guys, welcome back to the Evolve Mood Play podcast for episode 12. So today, our guest is Razib Khan, and I'm going to get into what he's all about in just a second. Before we get there, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping about what Evolve Mood Play is up to, and how you guys can come out and learn from us and support our work. So we have a series of workshops coming up this fall. First, we're going to be in Philadelphia. Uh, September 15th and 16th, and there are still tickets available for that, so move on those soon. Next, we're going to be in Spain, um, and this is one of our week-long intensive events, and these are some of the most powerful events that we can offer, and that's going to be the 1st through the 7th of October in the south of Spain, and you can find that in the intensive section on our website, evolvingplay.com, and then we're going to be uh, in um, London, for the 13th and 14th for a two-day workshop, and then finally we'll be finishing up the year with a two-day workshop in uh, San Francisco, the 3rd and 4th. So make sure to join us for one of those events. Um, we look forward to seeing you. Again, I mentioned this last time, but we have now started a Patreon, and we really appreciate your guys' support on Patreon so that we can continue to bring you high-quality guests like we have today and the best sort of movement, thinking, and development of the community. So thank you very much for any support you can give. So today my guest is Razib Khan, and this is an exciting episode for me because it's our first episode where our guest is not primarily a figure in the movement community. Razib is a geneticist. Um, he works in the, uh, in the uh, consumer genomics area right now, and I've actually been following his work since around 2004. He's been a, a very successful blogger with his blog, GNXP. It's gotten him articles written in the New York Times. And I think he's one of the best kind of public figures in talking about uh, what we know from genomics, while at the same time being a bit of a polymath who, tell, uh, who shares a lot of great information about history and, um, and evolutionary science in general. So Razib and I particularly have one topic that we're going over here, and this is... What I'm trying to do here is start helping the movement audience have a deeper understanding of a lot of the kind of primary issues that I see as relevant to grounding our understanding of movement. In particular, we're looking at the problem of how culture updates and the evolutionary process of updating and what that tells us about the problems that we have with movement culture today. So, Razib was a great guest, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy this uh, podcast and get a lot of insight in it. So keep listening, and once again, thank you guys for your support. More of the populist paleo world, which I mean is what people distill from paleo thinkers. Like, for example, um, you know, I know John Durant some, and he's a relatively sophisticated thinker in a lot of ways, and he's read my stuff as well. So he knows about human variation and evolution over time, all these things. And yet people who probably read John might not, you know, get all the subtle details. The main issue is this idea that, well, we are hardwired a certain way and that we are, we are walking cavemen with Pleistocene bodies and Pleistocene minds to a first approximation that's true, but that's trivial, right? So yes, we went through the Pleistocene and just to review, that's the several million years that the vast majority of human evolution occurred. We are currently living in the Holocene, which started at the end of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So the Pleistocene is the vast majority of human history. So that did shape our genome. It shaped our biology in a lot of ways. Before the Pleistocene, there were no humans. Right. Humans are a Pleistocene creation. So when people say we're a Pleistocene, you know, we have a Pleistocene mind for evolutionary psychology and a lot of the, bi the biological things in terms of biomechanics or physiology. I mean, that, that's technically true. Right. But what is the implication of that? Um, one of the implications that sometimes people make is how people lived in the Pleistocene is how we should live today. Yeah. Right. But um, there's two things. One is temporal. There was no one Pleistocene. So the Eemian interglacial more than a, like 100,000 years ago. So we are currently in an interglacial mm -hmm. from all we know. That interglacial, the Eemian, was actually warmer than we are today. Yeah. Okay. So there were periods when it was warmer than today. So the Pleistocene is not all ice ages. The last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago approximately is, uh, was one of the really coldest times, and it was relatively recent. But, you know, we've gone through warmer periods and colder periods. Now, the second thing is um, spatial. Not all populations underwent 
the same selection pressures because yeah. they live in different environments. And um, sometimes you can see the ghost of this in populations today. Um, Native American people, even if they're in the tropics, uh, their body plan, uh, their ratio of leg to torso and such is more like Siberians than it is like other tropical people. So um, I'm not sure everyone will be familiar with this, but how do we generally see the populations that are adapted to the tropics uh, differ from populations who are adapted to, uh, to, to Arctic environments? or Yeah, this, and this is not just humans. Um, this is general mammalian. I mean, it probably extends outside of mammals, but like it's often, often these things are generally mammalian. Um, the populations of the tropics are basically have a higher surface area to volume ratio, mm -hmm. so they're leaner looking. Right. Yeah. So if you look at if you look at an Arctic wolf and you look at a wolf from, say, Syria, because there are wolves in the Middle East, uh, Syrian wolves tend to be smaller and they often tend to be just leaner looking. Um, if you're in the northern climes, you need more body fat usually. And to preserve heat, you will also often um, just get stockier. Right. Yes. So uh, as an basically, when you increase the surface area, area available relative to the amount of volume of an animal you allow it to dissipate right. heat more effectively. exactly exactly so that's just like a, a standard it's it's basically what i'm saying here is mammals are subject to physics yeah <laughs> and so your environment um you know evolutionary pressures can happen in you know to, you can like characterize it in very different ways but one way you can say is like oh well they're environmental evolutionary pressures so adaptations to environments and then there's what we call biotic environmental pressures which is like inter interspecific competition or disease these sorts of things the environmental stuff is very very general across species right so you have all these laws like von Baer's law and uh, other things that are just related at Bergman's rule, all these things that are related to size and shape uh, based on latitude and climate. Mm -hmm. And so humans are subject to this too. Uh, pe people in Northern climates tend to have a stockier build. Um, I believe the legs are usually shorter yeah. um, and it, it, they're just built differently. I mean, sometimes their physiology is different. Um, there are populations of Siberia that seem to, uh, there's something with their metabolism where they basically give off a little bit more. They're a little, little less efficient, but that means that they give off more heat. Yeah. Right? And so they don't get sun, uh, they don't get uh, frost as easily. There's an obvious reason why that's, a, that's useful for them. Right. This is interesting from a, from a movement perspective, because we see that, that people who have these different types of body plans tend to uh, excel in different things or need yeah. to use sort of different adaptions. Like lifters. There's a lot of lifters from West Asia yeah, uh, Central Europe, Central Asia, areas that have relatively shorter legs, yeah, um, which allows for better biomechanics for the application of force to a barbell. Yep, yep. On the yep. other side, the top sprinters in the world tend to come from West African heritage, where relatively long legs means that you apply power to the uh, ground better for elastic demands. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, to 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 hone in a little bit here, uh, there's kind of three. So when I look at the way that people describe evolution there's well the first error is that a lot of times people look at evolution as a um as a teleological um process they Purpose. think that 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 there there's some automatic direction towards evolution and this a lot of people within the natural movement space are also kind of um interested in spiritual evolution and this okay. which is great as far as i'm concerned but it, it bothers me when they sort of conflate their idea about what the ideal spiritual development of a human being is mm -hmm. with these ideas about how we evolved to move and what's yeah. natural for us. So can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, the, the difference between a stochastic process, an evolutionary process, and, uh, and a teleological process and, and how kind of an evolutionary biologist looks at what it means that human beings have evolved in a specific way? Yeah, I mean, with the teleological process, in evolution, we don't even like, I mean, generally, we don't think in that way. So I mean, like, in terms of, I mean, you know, my understanding is that that has a purpose, an ultimate goal point. Yeah. So uh, if you're designing something as an engineer, uh, you have a purpose for mm -hmm. what, you know, you want that mechanism, um, that device to do, right? So intelligent design, um, the intelligent design theory um, is you know, there is a teleology there. Like the designer has an intent. It's, they're not designing willy nilly. Uh, evolutionary processes are not considered teleological because um, 
they're randomly exploring the space, right? Yeah. Now, you know, on the genetic level, on the molecular genetic level, some people would argue, and this is actually like not some people, probably the majority of you still, um, that our genetic variation is mostly determined by random movement, just sampling variants, like random genetic drift. But um, when it comes to our morphology and our physiology, like, you know, stuff we do, um, you don't want to be random, you know? Um, you want two arms and two legs, et cetera. And um, the purpose, if you want to say it that way, in the proximate sense, is just to survive and to have more offspring. And so this is a stochastic process that's exploring a whole parameter space of possibilities. But what is selected are those possibilities that increase fitness in the short term. Yeah. Now, the issue with evolution is in general, um, this is like, it's starting to get into philosophy because there are ways where evolution can like look a little further, but have to do with various feedback loops and like evaluating it, like, you know, group structures. But in general, evolution is looking like right in front of its nose. It's very nearsighted. And so this is one way evolution can, um, you know, get stuck on a local optimum, right? So it's not actually the best solution. Like if it was a teleological process, it would eventually go to the best solution. Yeah. But actually evolution is never going to go to the best solution because it went through a dead end and now it can't back out. So I think in general, um, the, the human spine is considered, you know, our back problems are due to the fact that we are, you know, originally quadruped organisms that transitioned to bipedalism. And um, that's just, there's just some problems with that. Yeah. And over, you know, we haven't been able to like fix those problems. because. Have you run into the research of Lynn Isbell? No, no. Uh, tell me about that. She's a, she's a, um, uh, anthrop uh, primatologist and mm -hmm. she, she's basically arguing that, that, uh, that snakes were one of the primary drivers of primate evolution. They're, uh, so we co-evolved with snakes and snakes are one of the, probably the predominant predator of primates over the longest period of time. Okay. Okay. Um, and she, she backs that argument by looking into the development of the visual system and how the visual system is more sophisticated basically in the primates that have had the longest exposure to snakes or have had the most potent venomous and, and, um, and, and constricting snakes in their environment. Mm -hmm. I bring that up only it's super interesting and you should, I think you'd yeah. be interested in it, but yeah, yeah, that sounds I, I bring it up uh, because what's interesting is, uh, is that's another example of probably a design flaw that we're just sort of stuck with. Yeah, because snakes aren't that big of a deal, unless you live in Australia. <laughs> primates were not in Australia until we got there. Yeah, um, but more than that, uh, so going back to that, the visuals, the, the, the mammal brain is set up as an olfactory brain. Yeah, yeah, that will, because we were, we were during the age of the dinosaurs, which is actually the majority of the existence of mammals. So yeah. the Cenozoic, um, yeah, because we're not, I think we're, past, we're still in the Cenozoic, is yeah. actually a rel, it's like, it's, I think it's shorter than the Cretaceous, right? So, you know, there's a Cretaceous, Jurassic, yeah. Triassic, and it's just like, I think mammals have been around since the late Triassic, like in some, like, you know, Jurassic. So most of the time of mammals, we have been nighttime, we've been rats. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so um, primates, a few other organisms, uh, a few other mammalian line lineages have gone more diurnal mostly, mm -hmm. but most mammals are still actually predominantly nocturnal. Yeah, so so the the olfactory bulb is 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 close to a lot of the like the central structures that are necessary in the brain because that's what made sense. But then as we became visually dominant, um, we had to wrap all this basically wiring around weird places in the brain to get back to the visual areas which were in the back of the brain because it just wasn't that important in the beginning. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting to think about how it it's easier for evolution to to basically junk wire a bunch of weird stuff into the back of the brain in yeah. order to build yeah. a visual creature than it is to try to reset where in the brain olfaction. Well, you got to go back to the beginning. It's like, you know, for the, for your, for the software engineers out there, it's like having tech debt. Yeah. Uh, it's like you just, you have to like design something, you have to, you know, spec, spec it out and then code it up and get it to work because you have a deadline. Now, if you had three, four, five, six times as much time, um, you might not do it like that, you know, but you're trying to get it done and you're breaking up to like modular um, steps and you want to get to the deadline and have a product out there that people can use because, you know, if people yeah. can't use the product, uh, that's a problem because you don't have the product, you know? So, um, you know, 
that's just, I think that's a good analogy. Another thing, the thing with evolution is obviously, you know, as an evolutionary geneticist, one of the things you're interested in are the parameters that affect the rate and nature of evolutionary process. So if you had an infinite amount of time with an infinite population size, with a large number of, with an infinite amount of mutations, um, you would, I mean, you would eventually get some perfect system for whatever was being selected for. Right. Yeah, this is perfect. We've, we've, we've happened right on to the central thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is this idea that, that evolutionary processes uh, create costly solutions. Yeah, yeah. So this is basically with what, what I think is happening with natural movement is part of a broader phenomenon where we're noticing that some of the stuff that got tossed out as our culture updated okay. was actually valuable. And that we're just trying to recover it, right? Sure. So I, I made a video a few years ago where, my, where I climbed through a waterfall. Mm -hmm. So I showed that video to my dad. Okay. And, and he said to me, like, wow, Rafe, must have been real scary climbing up through that waterfall. We only ever climbed down. <laughs> so it turned out this, this waterfall I climbed through, which was 45 minutes from the town I grew up in. Mm -hmm. My dad had been climbing it in high school 40 years okay. before. Okay. Okay. So like I grew up basically kind of like the last kid in the woods. All my yeah. friends started playing video games and I was the only guy out yes. there like climbing trees. Yes. But you go back a couple generations to my dad's generation and they were all, they were all wrestling with each other and, and kickboxing with each other. They were all like building forts in the woods. They're all climbing trees. Yep. 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 And, all, and, and the thing was nobody called that parkour back then. No, no, that was just called being a kid. It was just called being a kid, right? So, so what happened was that as the culture updated and we had now, you know, we had all this fear around kids being free. We had video games. We had structured sports. All that stuff just got lost. Yeah. And so now we're, we're realizing that it actually like rough and tumble play has these enormous impacts on social development, on physical development, and that it's, it's getting missed. So, so what I've been thinking is that this is actually part of a broader phenomenon where um, when, when you have to create a solution to a new problem mm -hmm. in an evolutionary way, you, and there's a lot of pressure to get to the solution, you're going to tend to come up, with, uh, come up against yeah. kind of costly solutions. You can well, I mean, solution, solutions that have costs that are significant. Yeah. So the example that, that I always give to people is sickle cell anemia. So yeah, that's, that's the best one. Yeah. So can you give people an example? Uh, can you, can you go break down like what sickle cell anemia is, why mm -hmm. it's common and kind of what that tells us about, uh, how selection works? All right. I'm, I'm not a molecular geneticist, just, you know, okay. don't do this at home. So I'm going to go like really general here, but basically the issue with sickle cell is that's how you absorb oxygen. Those red blood cells. Um, you know, there's some like mutation that affects the hemoglobin, I believe. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's you, your uptake is just really bad. Now, if you can't have like uptake on oxygen, you are sickly and you die. So sickle cell, um, the homozygous state. So if you, if you carry two copies, cause everyone has two copies of a gene. If you carry two broken copies, um, you used to die at a very young age. So it, it's, it really affects your fitness. Now, if you carry one copy, it turns out that you're much more resistant to malaria which used to kill many, many, many people, like huge proportion of the population would be, you know, infected with malaria at some point in large parts of Africa, also in the Mediterranean, South, Southeast Asia. Um, you know, actually malaria was present as far north as uh, New York City, you know, um, in the 18th century. So public health can really, because of mosquitoes. England but in any too. case, so you have this pressure of malaria, which is affecting more than half the population potentially. Um, and so you select for the sickle cell um, because malaria is bad. You know, like if you have a chance of getting malaria once or twice, I mean, you might like reduce your, you know, lifetime, like it might reduce in half your chance of like living to reproductive age, you know? So sickle cell, um, if you have one copy, you're much more resistant to malaria. So that's good. So it gets selected. The problem is when it gets selected, it increases in frequency. And when it increases in frequency, the two, ba two copies are more likely to come together. And when they come together, they're really, really bad. So what you see in populations that have the sickle cell adaptation is the frequency increases and then it stops increasing because, you know, a certain number of children are also going to die from yeah. people that are malaria resistant, right? They're not going to die of malaria. They're just going to die of, you know, the sickle cell disease. And so you have this suboptimal solution, which we've had 
it looks like the latest genetic research, we've had it for about 10,000 years. Um, this is actually an evolutionary conundrum for me because I'm like, why hasn't there a better solution emerged? And sometimes it can take a while. You know, um, what often happens is modifier genes, other things, basically adaptations get better and better over time. That's the theory. Yeah. But this is a case where it hasn't. Why not? I mean, there's various reasons it could be, but I mean, it's just a classic illustration of a costly adaptation. Yeah. And there, there are other adaptations to malaria, right, that are less costly? Yeah, yeah, there are other ones um, that are less costly. Some of the Mediterranean ones. So there's different types of malaria, I believe, like falciparum and other sorts. So um, this is, I think, the falciparum adaptation. But okay. Yeah, there are there are other adaptations in the Mediterranean and other places that are less costly. But I don't know if they. I don't think they adapt to the same type of malaria. So. So then, like. And you can think about this, like from a from like a software coding, right? You, yeah. you're going to write something into the code. You have to have a solution today. Maybe it's going to be junky and it's going to cause problems with the rest of your code. Yeah. Maybe it's going to be junky and it's going to just like make things not work well, but people. Well, it's, think- like a, it's like DLLs, dynamic link libraries in Microsoft. Yeah. Do you remember those? I don't remember those. So, okay. So I mean, DLLs were like, they were important. Um, I used to remember what they were in detail at one point cause I looked it up, but they were basically important back in the day when there wasn't that much memory. And so I think like there were like libraries that were used by multiple programs. So that way you didn't have to like reproduce libraries. Yeah. Right. Okay. But once there was a lot of memory, you didn't need DLLs. The problem with DLLs is they're interacting with all these programs. You install a new program. It modifies the DLL, breaks the DLL. And then a lot of programs can't run. It's a total pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. That was okay. When you had no memory, all of a sudden you have a lot of memory. You don't need DLLs, Mm -hmm. but that would mean redesigning windows. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And it would mean breaking a lot of applications and all these other things. And so they kept DLLs for a really long time when they didn't need DLLs. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And that was just because you needed DLLs in the conditions of no memory, you know, and I'm talking like 1990s, like this was not like the Commodore or whatever days, but um, you know, there's still like some memory constraints. I mean, I remember, I think I had like a laptop that was an okay laptop that I got in 1999 or 2000 and it had like, what, like six to eight gigs of, of memory. Oh, not memory, but like just hard disk space. Yeah, you're laughing. That's like that's like a thumb drive. I know. I'm just like we're, we're gonna use up, you know, half that on this interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was there was a problem like 15 years ago, 18 years ago, and now there's no problem. And so you know, I think I think the OS. I don't use Microsoft OS, so I don't know. But I actually like I do know they don't use DLLs anymore that's because cool. they redesigned it from scratch. But they had to invest a lot. Yeah. Like abandon all of this like effort. So I mean. Yeah, there's, there's ways you can optimize and improve Kluge solutions, but um, Kluge solutions hang around for a while because, I mean, the alternative is even costlier. Exactly. So as long as the alternative is costlier. So, so there's, there's this tendency to, adapt, uh, to evolve costly adaptions. And then the, one of the key understandings for me about that is that the, the longer evolution has to come up with a solution, the more likely it is to be elegant. And the and kind of the faster a change happens, the more likely yeah. a really costly um, yeah adaption yeah. is. So, is, is there any more refinement that we need to understand that that that? Core? Well, you know, yeah. Basically, if you have like a if you have like a shock, if you have an external shock to the selective environment, um, basically what happens is um, you can think of evolutionary process as just scrounging around for the best option available, yeah. right? Um, the best option available that like can keep you alive, it's like triage, you know, um, you know, your body is going into shock and it's shutting things down and that's bad, but that's better than the alternative. So you get these like crappy mutations. You're like, they've been hanging around. They're not that good. They're low frequency because they're selected against and all of a sudden they're beneficial. Okay. Let's use these. Cause that's all we got. Yeah. That is all we have. And, um, you know, initially, like, that's all you'll have. But over time, the theory is there should be other mutations that mask the bad effects. And so it'll get better and better and better, right? So if if the selection pressure stays the same. So one of the issues that you have here is if the selection pressure keeps flipping back and forth, you're always going to be off balance on some optimum, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get into that in a a second. So... um, so, 
so that there's two things that, that evolution can do then, right? So once you adopt a costly solution, then you can adopt modifications that, yeah, that make modify it our genes, possible. modify our variants. Yeah. Or you can, um, or some, a, a different solution to the same problem can yes. arise via mutation and outcompete the costly. Yeah. Solution. Yeah. Yeah. It would, there would be, there would be competition. There would be competition. Um, yeah. I, you know, I haven't looked this up in a while. I think usually, I don't know, I think modifier, it, de- it depends. It depends on like how big the gene is and how simple it is. So I'll give you an example. Um, there've been multiple ways that we've developed lactose tolerance, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it's because it's a big gene. And basically what you need to do is you need to break some process that shuts it down when you're an adult. Yeah. Right. And there's lots of ways to do it apparently. Okay. Right. Cause you're just breaking some regulatory process, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so there you have a situation where like if it had been bad and you know, we don't actually, I mean, it is actually bad. Um, it is bad to want to continue drinking milk beyond a certain, I mean, you can imagine because, because um, the fitness cost is like your mother never weans you. Yeah. Uh, you're still, you could still be in theory. You could still be breastfeeding when you're 10. <laughs> I've seen it. Okay. Well, I mean, you live in the Pacific Northwest. I'm from there too. I know how that goes. All I'm trying to say is this was, this was in West Virginia or Virginia, North Carolina. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, farmers markets, people are very liberal, you know, but um, there's a, there's a cost to uh, continuously like want to drink what's actually a child food mm-hmm. when you're not a child anymore. And so your body, your body's shutting it off. Right. And then there was a mutation, you know, less than 10,000 years ago, like 5,000 years ago, in Europe or in Central Asia that was basically like, oh, you know what? Like we can drink milk from other animals and that's nutritional and that has sugar. We want to break that down. Okay. So it breaks the gene. And then it happens again in Arabia. Then it happens again in Africa. So this is very useful and it happens over and over. Like this is a situation where I can imagine if it caused a problem, um, a better mutation would emerge, right? Yeah. Now there are other things that are more complicated where, okay, well maybe modifier genes. So it just, you know, there, there's some details with the genetics of adaptation that we need to think about. Um, I'm thinking with a lot of biomechanical th- things, they're a little complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if like alternative mutations is the way it would be, or it would be like mutations of different genes that are like shifting things around to just like, you know, dampen, dampen the costs. Okay. So then um, I wanted to get into kind of like, I'm trying to refine my understanding of also so my understanding is that when you when you have the target of selection, when a gene is under selection, because of the way that the genes are segregated from generation to generation, if it's under high selective, um, if there's high selective pressure around it, it will tend to move the whole region around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It also will be a selective sweep, it'll, and everything else will hitchhike all around it. So with the with the with the lactose tolerance that I'm talking about, the the LCT gene has a huge, huge block that's very homogenous because the mutation emerged, was very beneficial, started increasing in frequency, and because it was going up so fast, the whole region was yanked along. So there's another way that seems to me that, there, that we have a potential to sort of create junk in the code. Yeah, I, yeah. well, you're, you're, I mean, I, yes, you're not saying it the way that I would say it, but I actually know what you're saying, so you've inferred the correct issue. If you have other genes or other mutations that are hitchhiking along, mm-hmm. um, so long as the fitness benefit is positive, that region of the genome will increase. But if the positive variant has right next to it a negative variant, yeah, um, what you can have is a negative side effect. This is, I mean, this is not exactly it, but I mean, there's something called like you know, like the the gene environment, uh, the core, the the gene. Um, the genetic and phenotypic correlation matrix where you change a trait and has all these side effects yeah. because one, a single gene has a lot of effects, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, you push one way and that causes a problem in the other direction. Okay. That's one thing that's going on. Another thing is what you're saying directly in a genetic sense where you can have a negative very, a, a problem mutation hitchhike along mm-hmm. and you're stuck with it at least until like, uh, recombination breaks it apart and then eventually selection can drop that one away independently from the, the one you want. So changes, ch- we could say that changes that are 
you know, sort of orthogonal to the thing that's being selected. And they could be yeah. negative or, or positive or neutral. Yeah. yeah. Can be driven by something that's under selection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Traits can be, traits, just like genes, kind of hitchhike along um, from a gene, uh, from, a, from a mutation. I mean, like, you know, I'll give you a con concrete example. Pigmentation, um, it looks like a lot of the pigmentation pathways are all affecting your skin, but some of them affect eyes and hair. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's highly plausible that the blue eyes and lighter hair are simply side effects. They're tissue-specific gene expression side effects of those specific loci. There's a lot of genes that affect pigmentation, but a few of them seem to have um, selective expression in eyes and hair. So when you tweak those genes, to have say like a you know fifteen percent effect on skin, yeah. it has like a you know ninety percent effect on eyes. Yeah, so that gets into the other thing that I wanted to bring up, which is which is the fact that as you mentioned, genes have pleiotropic effects. Yeah, right. They have effects all over. So one of my favorite examples that that uh, that you've talked about extensively on your blog is the EDR gene. Yes, yes. Which uh, should I go? Should go, I go? Ahead, go ahead, yeah, tell us all. Yeah, about so it. EDR gene basically um, a lot of the characteristics we associate with East Asians, like especially the hair. The thick, straight hair. Um, there's issues related to their, their, their um, sweat glands. Um, so the EDR is glands? a huh? I think it's they have fewer apocrine glands, right? Yes, it is apocrine. You're exactly correct. Um, I didn't want to say it because I was like, oh, is that the right one? So there's <laughs> different types of glands, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in any case, um, basically, it's a recessive trait. A lot of these are recessive traits. You have to have two copies of EDR, mm -hmm. EDR, and um. It's, it's a master regular, regulatory gene that has a huge, huge role in early, um, basically like cell differentiation okay. in the zygote and embryo. So um, it does a lot of things and it's really important early on in development. Um, when you have two copies of the derived variant, which is the new mutation that emerged probably in the last like 20,000 years. So it's in, high, it's in moderate frequencies in um, Amerindian populations. It's in very high frequencies in Northeast Asia, in particular, say Korea. Okay. Korea has the like Korea in that northern China area has the highest frequencies, something like ninety five percent or ninety percent, you know. Um, and then it drops uh, ED, the the frequency of the derived variant of the new mutation drops in Southeast Asia like fifty percent, depending mm -hmm. on who you know where you go. And then in other places like in Finland, it's like two or three percent, but Finns are part Siberian. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's a telltale sign of recent Asian admixture or ancestry pretty much everywhere except for the new world among Amerindians. And it's associated with all these traits. We don't know what it's selected for though. Yeah. I think that's so fascinating. So like, so you mentioned the, the hair form There's the African glands. It also affects the, the shape and, and, and like firmness of breasts, doesn't it? Hey, you said it. I didn't bro. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to leave that out. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want you guys, you get in trouble with like, you know, PG is, you know. Uh, whatever. Uh, oh, <laughs> so I just think it's interesting because, because we know that it's having all these effects. Doesn't it even have effects on a uh, tooth form? Yeah, the shovel shaped incisor. Shovel shaped incisor. It's happened multiple times. Uh, I think it's, yeah, shovel shaped. It's happened multiple times in human evolution. Neanderthals also had shovel shaped incisors. Also, this is like, uh, this is like not totally related. Ancient DNA has shown that hunter-gatherers that lived in Scandinavia um, five to 10,000 years ago, many of them also had a derived variant of EDAR. Interesting. Uh, it separately derived or, or the same? Last I checked, um, it was the same one. So it's been floating around for a while. But it disappeared in, in Europe. The Finns are the only ones that seem to have it now. So, and they're recent and mixed. So it, it disappeared in Europe. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's continue with the central idea. Um, so if we we know, okay, there's there's a you know, you can have a mutation um, that allows you to fix a uh, a a problem, but that mutation has cost, right? Yeah. Um, if you have a if you have anything that's under positive selection, then it can hitchhike regions around it. Yep. And then a gene can have effects across many things. Yeah. Plantro. Uh, that, that it has this pleiotropic effect. So if you, if all of a sudden, you know, the, the toy example I like in my head is imagine that all of a sudden you had to say um, score 10 points a night in the NBA to be able to have children. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all of a sudden every gene that's associated with height is going to be, um, is going to be positively selected for, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I mean, there's thousands of genes associated with height, correct? Yeah. So if, well, yeah, thousands. 
hundreds to thousands, depending on what proportion of the variation you want to explain. But yes, okay. yeah. on so, the order of a thousand, I don't know. Huh? Yeah, on the order of a thousand, maybe okay. something like that. So let's say there's a thousand genes that are associated with height, but those genes that are associated with height, that's not all they do. No, 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 no. Height is probably like a minor thing that they do. So if they're, if you, if you pull the whole population towards being taller, you're going to be affecting all these other functions that the genome does. Yeah. Yeah. That could be, um, I need to think about this in detail because the issue with height is it's one of those things that's been under, um, balance, some sort of balancing selection. You don't want to get too tall and you don't want to get too short, but there's still variation in there due to like mutation and just like different selection pressures in different places. Um, I think the genes that are varying in a way to change height, probably they've, they're generally the type of genes that aren't too integrated into all these complex networks or you die, you know? <laughs> now there are, some, there are some height genes, there are some height genes we know, like that cause dwarfism, right? Yeah. Some height alleles, mutations, that cause dwarfism that reduce your fitness. Also, if you get too tall, um, there's all sorts of problems. Men, when men, I think their their life expectancy starts dropping a lot above like six three or six four. So like the human body doesn't scale very well, you know, it yeah. doesn't scale very well um, beyond a certain height. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've certainly noticed like athletically, it seems like you know, I'm I'm kind of, I'm I'm six foot one, so okay, it seems like that's a good height. Yeah, there's not there's not too many guys who like really move in a in an aesthetically pleasing sort of way. Yeah. Once you get up yeah. above, say, 6'3", they're out so, there. So, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, do you know, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but I mean, average height of uh, like Special Forces Navy SEALs. 5'10"? Yeah. Five and yeah. It's, because, it's because big guys can be really strong, mm -hmm. but they can't lift themselves up over things. Um, they, just, they don't have like the flexibility and the nimbleness to do all the things that the Special Forces require, even if they're strong. And they also, I think they have issues with endurance, even if they are strong. Yeah. So, um, it's just, they don't, it, humans don't scale that well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think like, yeah, one, I think five foot 11, six foot and the 190 is like perfect for the military. You can't, you can't be too much bigger. Or you start breaking down too easily. Yeah. And these guys yeah. have huge amounts of weight around. It's crazy what they do. So, okay. So we've laid out kind of the, the genetic, uh, aspects of this, this problem of costly adaption. Now, you're also really interested in cultural evolution. And what I've started to think is that mimetic evolution has the same sort of tendencies in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That any yeah. evolutionary process has this potential for us to adopt costly solutions. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've been really inter influenced by the work of Jordan Peterson recently. And he, he, you know, he's talking a lot about uh, this, this Nietzschean idea that, that, uh, that the death of God destabilized um, Western society. And so I've started to think about that as a, uh, as like a, imagine it as a, like an evolutionary process. If you imagine that belief in the, the deity of Christ, mm -hmm. is like a, is like a selective unit and that it's accumulated all of these genes around it, all these structures and functions around it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that all those get destabilized when you get rid of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, so this is the issue. I mean, like, I mean, you don't need to like, you don't need to appeal to Nietzsche or Jordan Peterson. Like this is actually like a relatively straightforward thing, right? It's mm -hmm. called, it's like, it goes back to Durkheim. Mm -hmm. I mean, arguably, you know, Ibn Khaldun had this sort of idea too about like society as an organism. Yeah. Um, organisms have adaptations and something like religion is, an or is part of the organism is integrated in a lot of things. And, you know, in the West today, people tend to have a radical Protestant view that religion is a set of precise beliefs and formulas. Yeah. But in most cultures, in most times, religion is, is, is beliefs, but really it's practices, beliefs, folkways, orientations, um, customs, traditions, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is a school, um, it's called functionalism. Um, functionalism has a, you know, it means a lot of different things in a lot of contexts. In evolutionary anthropology, functionalism is the idea that, um, you know, cultures have adaptations with particular functions and they're selecting across each other. Um, there's a whole school of thought, which is relatively credible in my opinion, that um, certain types of organized institutional religions um, emerged um, and became prominent after the rise of agriculture because they allowed mass society uh, to flourish, yeah. right? So for example, like Hammurabi's laws 
that is something that is only necessary in a society where people can be anonymous, mm -hmm. right? And big gods, you know, that's the term from big gods um, that can see you wherever you are and that like, no, no, that don't know, they don't, um, they, they know no Greek or, you know, like Jew or Gentile, these sorts of things where they're universal and they're abstract. That only makes sense in a society that's complex and has large scale, right? Yeah. Now, um, going back to what you're saying, like, okay, you, you, you kill God and that like yanks all these, you can think of God as like kind of like uh, the hub mm -hmm. and the characteristics as the spokes. Like the spokes can still be around, but if you pull the hub around, they're useless. So that might be the analogy that I would use. Yeah. Another, another analogy that strikes me is like you, there are certain, like you talked about regulatory genes, key regulatory genes. There are certain sort of structures that when you, when you mess with them, you get big effects. Like yeah, the, yeah. the one that, that pops up to mind right now is like, um, uh, I think it's the Hawks genes that are associated with, with evolution or with domestication. So if uh, not, it's not, it's not Hawks. Hawks is, um, I think it has more to do with like, uh, is it body plan? Yeah, I think it has more to do with, but, but there are domestic neural crest genes. Neural crest genes. Yeah. The neural crest genes are, are what basically is the kind of the mechanism, the lever we pull on to create an animal that, that we can deal with. Yeah. Um, but in order to, to get a, an animal that acts like a dog, it turns out that you, that you affect a lot of things about the way, you know, about the structure of a dog. Like a dog yeah. doesn't look like a wolf anymore. No. And a pig doesn't look like a boar anymore. If you select for these changes in behavior. Yeah. Um, so uh, then, partly that's like straightforward pleiotropy, by the way. Yeah. Can you actually, why don't you break that down? I don't think the, the audience necessarily knows about this. And I think this is super interesting. I, I, well, I mean, so there, there, there's, um, I think the key, key way that they can figure this out is like, look up the silver, fo the, what is it like the silver fox domestication? Yeah, um, it's Believ experiments. Yeah. Called? Yeah. And so basically they tried to turn foxes into dogs and some of the same tendencies. Um, basically dogs are big puppies. Uh, wolves are not puppies. Wolves grow out of being puppies. And so, um, you know, they're floppy ears like a puppy, like a wolf puppy. Um, just their facial features are foreshortened a little bit uh, like a puppy. Um, some of the patterning um, of the pelage of dogs is also um, unique and that probably is just due to selection for these sorts of domestication things. Uh, some of the behavior, um, just like the pro-sociality in a very, very guileless way is like a puppy, yeah. you know? So you have all these characteristics and they're integrated together with these neural crest genes. And, um, you know, they just, they, they, I mean, some of it is like, you know, in the older literature, you would say pediomorphism or selection for neoteny, mm -hmm. you know? And so there are genes that can regulate like development, right? So you just change the development genes, you toggle them around and you shift development and that has these like macro effects. Um, some of them, like for example, spackling on the chest of a dog, yeah. that has nothing directly to do with anything people are selecting for, mm -hmm. but that's really common when you select for these sorts of domesticated animals. And it's just because like there are certain pigmentation pathways, I think that affect pelage that are also hormonal yeah. that affect hormonal or vice versa. I think like test, if you upreg upregulate testosterone, you often up upregulate melanocortin just so you get darker. Yeah, okay. So men tend to be darker than women in their yeah. skin. Mm -hmm. And if you take testosterone, I think you get, if you take steroids, testosterone, you, you can exhibit some tendency towards getting swarthy relative to what you are, your baseline. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, I, my understanding is you with the like you select belly have selected for basically animals that were intrinsically attracted to 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 people. wanting to interact, to being prosocial towards people. Yeah. yeah. And then you saw that essentially all the ways that a that a, a dog all the different types of ways that dogs differ from wolves yeah. showed up also in foxes. So you got floppy yeah, yeah. ears. You got changes in the tail form. You got uh, changes in in hair length characteristics. You got yep. uh, curly fur showing up, um, and you got the coloring, which is interesting because you talked about melanocort. And so my understanding is the the as the neural spine develops, um, the the melanocortin comes out, and the the the, uh, the mel uh, melanin, the pigmentation comes out, and it starts at the at the spine. And so one of the things when that breaks is you get these piebald characteristics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which you yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. Which you don't, you don't see. You don't more developmental biology, frankly, than me. But yes, that does ring a bell. Piebald <laughs> are the same, though. Yeah. 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 This is really fascinating stuff. So, um, so, so anyways, it just popped into my head that that's a really interesting example of like you, you can have 
uh, a central sort of hub within an evolutionary process, you break it and then all the spokes become sort of destabilized. Yep, 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 yeah. Or you like, you, you add a hub and like a bunch of spokes that were already there yeah. um, get into place and you see this like, okay, like a wheel is a wheel. Yeah. You know? And so it's, mammals, I mean, it's not just mammals. I mean, with pigmentation, it's tetrapods. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there are certain genetic pathways that are very ancient and that mammals just toggle constantly in various ways, but they're toggling the same general pathways. I mean, the genes are what we call ortho, you know, orthologous. Um, they're not the exact same genes, but they're derived from the same ancestral genes, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Orthologous. yeah, that just means, all that means is like they're different species. And so when I say like, let's say like melanocortin, okay, like that gene, melan like MC1R, I think that gene was discovered in mice. Okay. Right. But that gene in humans, um, it's not the exact same gene, but it's derived from the ancestral like melanocortin gene, okay. right? Human melanocortin genes are going to be very similar because we're the same species. Right, the mouse melanocortin gene is going to be somewhat different because it's you know been like seventy million years since <laughs> we diverged from mice, right? Yeah. So melanocortin is um the genes that's associated with red hair. If you you know lose yeah. a lot of melanocortin and stuff like that, mm -hmm. so it's the same. So um okay, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a tangent from off of what I wanted to talk about, but I think it's really worthwhile and would be very interesting to my audience in particular. So we're talking about the genes that affect uh the genes that create domestication syndrome. To uh, what degree do you think the, what do you think about the hypothesis that that's one of the primary drivers of human evolution over the last say 10,000 years? Yeah, I mean, collected along those same pathways that we- Yeah, have? I mean, I think that's plausible. Um, the testing of it, so one thing that they found is, uh, so if you wanna look at, look at the pigmentation, um, humans have gotten lighter. Okay. Um, it seems in Eurasia over the last 10,000 years. But when people have looked at pigmentation within populations, um, depending on how you define it, um, the lighter people within the populations are not any more domesticated in behavior, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's not the behavioral differences that you would expect. Yeah. So um, the hypothesis, I think, is a plausible hypothesis. And it's been validated in some organisms, but it doesn't seem like that's been validated in humans. So what we need, um, we know humans are more gracile right now. Yeah. Okay, like you can't deny that. Our teeth are tiny. Um, you know, there's various Four other things. shortened. Yeah. It would be really hard um, to, I mean, we have to be somewhat pro-social or at least inured to anonymous interaction if we've lived in uh, agricultural societies for 10,000 years. Yeah. Right? So if you're an Australian Aborigine, um, you might predict because like they were hunter-gatherers until very recently um, that they're might be less comfortable in sort of like anonymous, like, you know, really dense. I mean, I know, I know like Mongols, for example, it's like a stereotype, but um, they don't like to be indoors in buildings if they don't have to be, you know? I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, a lot of people are like that. Yeah. I, I mean, I find that interesting because like, you know, th obviously this is very plausibly just sort of a, a kind of romanticism about myself, but I, I have a kind of, I'm a very outdoorsy sort of guy, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm, I'm big, I'm physically robust, I'm fairly- You're kind of primal, bro. <laughs> um, and and I, case, bro. I, I have ADHD. And, yeah. and I believe that, uh, tell me if yeah. this is correct, but I, I remember running into to findings that ADHD, the gene, what is it? Um, uh, DRD5? DRD4. DRD4, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's variation. Yeah, there's variation in that. So that, I, there haven't been very many follow-ups, but um, people have been writing about this for a while. Yeah, I, I seem to remember that that in pastoral populations, it was under positive selection. Yeah, it could be. Um, I will tell you, um, I know people that are going to be investigating personality variation across human populations as a function of uh, what you would say is mode of production. Okay. Right? So if you're like descended from like peasants that have been peasants, you know, it's just... The issue is like if you're if you are a Norwegian Sami, uh, your ancestors have been nomadic for a long time, as opposed to if you are Italian, your ancestors have been farming for like I don't know, like eight thousand years or something, you know. Yeah. So um, and living in villages for eight thousand years, um, it's hard to imagine that 
Um, the, the distribution of personality types um, are, is going to be exactly the same in those two populations, but people need to investigate that. Partly they don't understand the genetic basis of personality types. Um, they understand that it's heritable, but they don't understand the genetic basis too well. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're going step by step in that direction. That seems really interesting. Um, just to go back for a second to the idea of, of human domestication, because I think that's something that, that my, my listeners will be really interested in. We said we, we use some pretty, uh, more specific language we talked about gracial, gracil, gracilation, gracilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. gracility. So we used to be way more robust. Yeah. Like if you look at skulls from, you know, 10 to 20 before 10,000 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, they're just like, I mean, so when you say gray cell, basically headed people. Yeah. Gray cell just means basically slimmer, less light, light. Yeah. Light, light, lighter built, light skeletons. I mean, yeah. I think skeletons are probably like, um, energetically expensive. So like, uh, to give an example to people like, um, a, uh, a bulldog has a robust head or a, a mastiff has a robust head. Whereas like a whippet has a gray cell head. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Um, basically just like lightly built, you know, or like a Maine Coon cat versus a yeah, Siamese yeah. cat. Yeah. Um, although a Maine Coon, a lot of that's like fluff, but I mean, <laughs> I used to work in cat genetics, so I, I gotta be, be yeah, clear yeah. on that. No, that's cool. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, one of the issues is like, you know, when you say someone's heavy set or stocky, but they're actually not fat, mm -hmm. they don't have body fat really. It's just that they're, they literally are heavy set or stocky. I mean, some of it is probably just like their bones are like, you know, a big boned is a euphemism for being overweight, but these people were big boned. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm no. Not, you know, they were literally big boned and there are big boned people today, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm one of them. Like people, people generally guess that I weigh about 190 pounds and I'm closer to 215. And if you, uh, and if you like, you know, find someone of similar size to me yeah. and you, and you like look at how big their fist is or yeah. wrap your fingers around their like. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm the descendant of like civilized people. I'm really <laughs> lightly boned, you know, my, um, my yeah. wrists are pretty, you know, so yeah, like I'm the, I'm at the opposite. I have very narrow waist. Um, yeah. I just, I don't have like, didn't put on too much extra bone, you know, yeah. because like I, I wasn't going to go running around hunting. I don't know, you know? Um, so, and then the other aspect of it was you talked about the foreface, foreface. So this is something we see in, in, in almost all domestic animals is that the, the length of the snout shortens relative to the length of the snout in, uh, in, in their ancestors. Right. So uh, puppies have small snouts relative yep. to adult. Yep. You, yo, like, some young mammals tend to. Yeah. Like you, and that's very noticeable in humans compared to Neanderthals or, or oh, Neanderthals were human. True. Um, Anatomically modern humans have relatively for, uh, shortened forefaces compared yep. to we're uh, flat faced. Yeah, flat faced. We're very flat faced. Um, so, I mean, uh, the standard explanation for that is we got small teeth, small jaw, flat face. Um, you know, we process our food. Yeah, it's food well, processing. Our food is just not very tough. Yeah, you yeah. know, like Neanderthals, like it looks like I think when they look at their teeth, like those people were chewing a lot. They were doing a lot of chewing and mastication. So I don't know what they were eating. I mean, they're like sophisticated enough. They must have had fire, you know? I think oh, yeah. that yeah, fire is like two million. There's still arguments, but yeah, I think the hypothesis is it probably goes back to Erectus. Yeah. You know? So yeah, it goes back a long time. So Erectus is about two million years ago. I think it's closer. Yeah, it depends on how you define it. I think it's closer to a million, but you know, one and a half to two million. Yeah, something like that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, think it's in Georgia is 1.8 million. And I think they say that's erectus. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Two million. Erectus is yeah. kind of a big, uh, yeah, it's a big catch all. It's a big catch all. It's like stuff that's like a long time ago and kind of different yeah. and not a hobbit, you know, and not a hobbit, not an Australopithecine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, we became, the theory is we became grassland partly because we could, um, mm -hmm. settling down for agriculture. You're eating like this, like, crappy gruel all the time but you're not eating all the tough you know stuff that you used to eat and also um another issue is like just in terms of your nutrient i mean you're not getting as much calcium as you used to like in terms of the diversified yeah. hunter gatherer lifestyle yeah, you get yeah. a lot of micronutrients you get a lot of minerals you get some protein you get some fat once you become a farmer you're basically eating gruel <laughs> yeah every like day. porridge yeah. I, I, I read a, an account of a, um, an experiment in the UK where they, they basically recreated a Celtic Iron Age village and they lived essentially exactly what they, they would have had. So they, yeah. they, they grew their own grains, they had their own sheep and it was like they, 
barley porridge for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with yeah. some beans and a pia, uh, like a bone of a pig or something once yeah, a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically like at a Malthusian like maximum limit of like these peasant societies. That's what, I mean, they didn't eat much meat. You know, they got like no fresh vegetables normally. You know, they could forage a little bit, but really there's not, you know, you cut down the forest, where are you going to forage, you know? So yeah, they're just having okay. gruel. I'd love to, 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 to pick your brain a little bit more about the Malthusian limit and what life was like in Hunter Forges because I think it's a big area of kind of misunderstanding right now. But I want to yeah. just kind of, really finish up this, this, this idea around, um, around costly evolution, because it's, it's, it's central to my thinking right now. It's something that I really wanted to, 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 to pick your brain about. Uh, but the, okay. So if we, if we look at, at mimetic evolution, actually, uh, can you hold one second? My yeah. power is getting low. I need to get my charger. Okay, cool. Well, it's going to take like, you know, yeah, no problem. 15 seconds. All right. Mimetic Perfect. evolution. Mimetic evolution. Okay. So, um, I'm a believer in the fact that cultures evolve in the same sense that not in, not precisely the same way, but in the same sense that, that, uh, that biology evolves and they evolves it to create a, I think of technology uh, of culture as a sort of technology that allows our biology to express itself in the environment and, and do what it needs to do. Right. Yeah. And that's a plausible, that's a totally fine definition. Yes. Um, that's, I don't, I don't think that's, that captures everything that culture is. I think there's a lot of kind of ornamentation on top of that. Mm -hmm. but that if culture fails to do that, it will die out, right? If you have a culture that tells you don't have children, your culture just ceases to exist. Yep. Uh, to the first order, the culture has to like perpetuate the genetic <laughs> reproduction. Yeah. I, I, I was listening to something recently where they're talking about uh, religion um, and they're saying that like uh, in order for religion to propagate itself, it has to, it has to work with the underlying architecture of the human psychology. Yes, yeah, that's exactly true. So there, there's Religion, religions that like work against human psychology don't spread. Yeah. So there's a, basically there's like a a culture a culture cultural features exist within a selective landscape that's conditioned on underlying human like evolved psychology. Yeah, yeah. And then the ecological and economic environment, right? So Yes. So what you're talking about here is, um, you know, this is like um, from Pascal Boyer, Scott Atron, yeah. uh, you know, Dan Sperber, the epidemiology of ideas. The ideas are being selected within your cognitive landscape. The cognitive landscape, the parameters there are due to the evolutionary background of like what was useful. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, for example, the, 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 the most straightforward one, why do people believe in gods? Because mm -hmm. um, we have a strong agency detection mechanism. We have a strong agency detection mechanism because if you, think th if you think something is there in the forest and there isn't, okay. Yeah. Now, if you don't think something is there and something is there, you get killed. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a strong bias to think, to think something is there. And so we tend to see agency in the universe, which results in supernatural agents, which we call gods, okay? Yeah. So, okay, that's how that meme spread so easily yeah. we already have a strong intuition that's ad adaptive mm. then the second thing you're talking about how oh well religion has to adapt to the environment there's more to religion than just belief in gods yeah. right so the shakers um were a group i think they derived from the quakers um but anyways they're a radical yeah. protestant group they believed in um and this was actually a belief of many early christians including saint paul of celibacy even if you were married yeah right and they believed in god so they were religious but their belief in celibacy was not adaptive on a cultural level. <laughs> yeah. Say shakers are gone. Yeah. Like they, used, they, they recruited, they recruited through, through um, adoption and other things. But yeah. really the reality is like that's, that sort of recruitment um, only worked when there were a lot of poor kids that needed, you know, like now there's a foster system. Okay. So that, that actually, is, um, that takes me in an interesting place because I think about that in reference to the modern Western world, right? We, we, I think that culture kind of has two, you have a horizontal transfer of culture and, yeah. and a vertical uh, transfer of culture. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Looks like right now, um, the current sort of iteration of Western culture is extremely uh, virulent horizontally, but it, it's- uh, Aspects of it, aspects yeah. of it. 
but it tends to uh, decrease vertical transmission, right? Because, because everywhere that it's becoming more common, people are having fewer children. Yeah, but the vertical transmission, so the vertical transmission, you're, but here you're, I think you're conflating cultural to biological. Well, um, because vertical so course, transmission can be cultural and biological. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not right? I, just you have biological children doesn't necessitate that they have your culture. Sure. And just yeah. your biological ch- children, mm-hmm. they're not your biological t- children, doesn't necessitate they don't have your culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I totally get that. What I'm, what I'm, I'm thinking about over time is that if groups are able to stay within themselves and promote a culture that's pronatalist, that that culture will tend to, to, uh, yeah, to to expand over time. Right. Yes. Like, you know, yeah. the Amish are a good example. Like the, you look at the population curve of the Amish. I mean, they're a small percentage of the population, but they're going up and up. Yeah, yeah. their absolute numbers have increased a lot in the last hundred years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I, okay, but let, let's let's move on from that for a second because I want to kind of get to this last thing, which is my basic, you know, the basic thing that I think what I'm doing is about is recovering positive cultural technologies that have got junked in the code. I see. That's, that's what natural movement is about. And, and I think it's part of a broader cultural trend that we're looking at where we're needing to be able to sift, um, uh, sift for value within older cultural technologies in a more effective way because we're yeah. having to update. And we have this central problem, which is that, so if culture is this adaptive process that, um, that is constrained by, you know, allowing you to function in that economic and ecological kind of landscape. Yeah. What happens when the speed of the change in the landscape increases exponentially? Yeah. And it is, it is. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of messed up stuff happens. So the reason that the reason that this Western culture is expanding so fast, I think there's two reasons. I think one is the epidemiology of ideas, mm-hmm. uh, eating a lot, doing whatever you want to do, um, you know, fuck y'all. Sorry, I just swore, you know, yeah. is uh, it's attractive. Now, historically, you couldn't do that. Yeah. Because if you're on the Malthusian limit and you have like scarce resources, you need to, you know, pick your, pick your battles. Mm-hmm. Um, today, we live in a cultural plenitude of surplus. And so people can do whatever they want. If you want to like tell your family to go to hell, you're not going to starve to death. Yep. In the past, you would. Right? Confucianism makes sense because, I mean, someday you're going to be old and, you know, also you might need your brothers and sisters, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need that today. Today we have the state. Yeah. We have the state to take care of us. And so, um, but why do we have all these things? Well, we have all these things, a large extent, science and engineering and innovation. And like Western culture, just like, it just killed. It just crushed. You know, yeah. it's slayed so to speak, all the other co- competitors. And so they, they, they want to adopt it, right? They want to adopt it. So this individualism, I think it's hard to disentangle it from scientific innovation that gives us wealth and power. Yeah. But the individualism is also corrosive in other ways. And I'm an individualist myself. Like, you know, like I'm very like heterodox, like individualist person. I feel it myself. Yeah. I, I, um, I mean, it's easy. I mean, I want to make my own decisions and have my own house and do my own thing and you're not going to tell me that's the American way. Yeah. You know, but the, the side effect are what is what you're talking about. You know, um, I have friends who, you know, they're like real example, you know, I think I told you this once, but like, um, you know, they're just like, you know, we, we have to live in New Jersey cause you know, we don't have that much money. Um, and you know, uh, the guy is like relatively senior at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> So he's like comparing himself. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah. not like I have like a house in the Caribbean. I mean, I just, yeah. you know, I just have like a really nice house in Hoboken or wherever, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I go on trips to the Caribbean mm-hmm. every year for like you know three weeks. Yeah, yeah. You know, so just, I mean, that's like a modest lifestyle of like yeah, it's, that, like you like know, four hundred thousand right? dollars a year can like you know give you. Yeah. You know? Or I have friends, like I do have a friend. And like they're just struggling in Palo Alto with like a household income of three fifty. I mean, it's just it's a struggle. Yeah, you know. So that's a real problem. So um, this central idea of mine that that we have uh, we have the problem of of having to update when 
to, to an exponentially changing world. And when the, co- when the costs of updating are always potentially high, right? Yeah. Yeah. The costs of updating are, it's cognitively expensive too. Yeah. You know, you just want to do what everybody else does, what feels good. Don't overthink it. Don't overplan it. That's why credit cards are popular. (laughs) I wanted to to bring this up because it was a really striking thing. I remember you posted a a graph on your blog once, which was like um, the value of free thinking. And it was basically zero in a culture that changes. Yes. Not at all. Yes. Highest in a culture that changes moderately. And then it goes back to zero when the change is too fast. Yeah. The issue with the change is too fast is... um, you, you develop a new solution and it's out of date. Yeah. I think that's what you're recalling right there. Mm-hmm. You want like a moderate level of change probably to optimize individualism and innovation and creativity mm-hmm. or incentivize it, right? If there's no change, you know, you should just do what your ancestor did because you're still, you're here. Yeah. You know? There's no value to free thinking because, you know, the solutions have been accumulated over time and the likelihood that you're going to come up to with a better solution to the same problem that your ancestors have faced for 10,000 years is relatively low. It's low and you're just expending time and effort doing yeah. nothing while yeah. other people are getting ahead. So I think this is such a central problem that we face though, right? Like how technology and capitalism and world politics are moving faster than they yeah. have any time in history. Yeah. And that's only going to like, I think people have no idea how problematic the development of artificial intelligence is. And I'm not even talking about like- This might be, this might be the last human century. Yeah. And not yeah. because of a global catastrophe of like the environment. It could be, we, 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 do, we allow the emergence of our successors. Yeah. And, but even if, you, even if you posit that for whatever reason, AGI never comes into existence. Yeah, it's impossible for some structural reason. Even if you posit that, just even aside from that, yeah, yeah, just look at like as we improve our ability to create limited intelligences that solve any set of problems that humans have, we're going to be we're going to be shifting the ecology with an economics within which human behavior operates in massive ways. You remember the Biggie Small song? Um, Back when we were when we were youngins, uh, <laughs> more money, more problems. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think I was like dumb as fuck. Okay, I gotta say, like, I would love more money, though. I have to say, like, um, this thing right here, you yeah. know, is more powerful than any computer I had ten years ago. Maybe mm-hmm. even like five. I don't know. You know, the things that it does are godlike. Yeah. You know. And we take it for granted and we love it. And I always got it on my person. I'm getting texts right now because, you know, <laughs> I get texts. I'm a person yeah. that lives in the year 2018. And you know yeah. what? It just stresses me out a lot. Oh, it's horrible. So why do I have it? Why am I so happy when I turn it off for a weekend when, I, when there's no work deadlines? So, I, so you're familiar with the paperclip problem, I'm sure, right? No, I, I've heard of it. I forgot it. Tell me again. Okay, cool. So the paperclip problem is basically uh, if we created a, uh, an AGI or if there's a singularity or um, a moment in which a artificial intelligence becomes self-aware and then it can start augmenting itself and fixing itself. Let's say that, that the central thing that, that that general intelligence was designed for is paperclip production. Yeah. Like that's its central ethic. It, it exists to make sure that there are more paperclips in the world. And that's, so that's, everything becomes a paperclip. Yeah. So then it makes, it makes all the paperclips we'll ever need yeah. because it expands its intelligence vastly. And now humans are like, well, we don't need any more paperclips. We're going to try to shut down your factory. And so it, theoretically, if, if, if it's central ethic is paperclips, then it'll just kill us because we're yeah, in the way of- Paperclips are like the, the, the best of all things. Exactly. So uh, I, I, I read this essay recently where they're basically positing this essentially is what capitalism already is. Capitalism is, is not a, a conscious intelligence, but it's a networked intelligence that operates towards the production of goods, whatever the goods are. And it sacrifices whatever is necessary to achieve those goods. Call people. Yeah. So we've, we've, we are all the beneficiaries of this, this intelligence. It has, I mean, 138,000 people a day are lifted out of extreme poverty and it's because of capitalism, free trade yeah. and technology. And, and like, 
I think people are, are way overconfident about the idea that like they would like living in the Pleistocene. Right? <laughs> it's like, you really want to go back to a world where 30% of your male kin are going to be, uh, are going to be murdered. What? What I like to tell people is we live in utopia. We just don't know it and we never will know it. Because once you, once, once you get to utopia, there's always a better utopia. Sure. Yeah. That's part, that, that's, I, um, I think that we live in a material utopia, but what it turns out is that material utopia isn't actually sufficient for the human psyche. It's not, but material utopia, um, like you could live on welfare and you know not starve and have some things and have entertainment yeah. and have leisure to reflect very mm-hmm. few people do that the people that live on welfare aren't using their leisure to reflect <laughs> that's true and the people that want the leisure to reflect are not on welfare they're working their butt off mm-hmm. what's up with that well um i don't know i do have a friend who uh who's figured it out he's got his his sales funnel for his online products and he's He's found the right around amount of money, moved to a place that's a lot cheaper and spends yeah. most of his time walking in the woods and reflecting. But I think that most people, they're just caught up in the game. And uh, Yeah, well, the, the whole idea is that you win the game, you break out of it, but most people won't. There's a, capitalism well, that, has, has a cultural power. Yeah. You know, you just want to be involved in that game. So what, what I notice, what I see is that we have this problem where we have unmatched affluence. It's driven by, by capitalism. But what capitalism wants is to treat human beings as fungib- uh, fungible entities. Yeah. So it wants, production. Yeah, it wants to disrupt anything that prevents you from being a, a fungible asset. Unfortunately, the things that that disrupts is your connection to your environment, your connection to your family, your connection to your friends, your connection to your own, your own movement practice, doing anything that's not involved in, in, in consumption. Yeah. Production. Yeah. Yeah. Production. Exactly. Production that leads to consumption of yeah. things that need to be produced. Yeah. So you, like movement does not need to be produced in a capitalist system. Yeah, exactly. Just is. You know, it, watching stuff on YouTube, <laughs> that that's, that's consumption producing yeah. stuff on YouTube. That's production that, that codes is something within the capitalist system. When I go play in the woods with my friends, that doesn't really code as something in the capitalist system. It, it, it it's, it's not intrinsic to that process. And so I think the problem that we face is that it, it's slowly sort of eroding that. Yeah. So then the question we have is how do we build a, a sort of cultural structure that allows us to harvest the benefits of that system? Because anyone who thinks that we're walking away from that either is okay with the murder of like 5 billion people. Yeah. Or, or, you know, just isn't serious about, like, from my perspective, they're not thinking seriously about the problems that it's already solved and how difficult yeah, it would yeah. be. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this is a complicated issue. There might be no final solution uh, because, like, evolutionary process never ends. Yeah. It's always racing itself. One of the, the medium-term solutions is simply going to be that the future is inherited. So, for example, uh, you know, we both have three children. Yeah. There's an opportunity cost to that. Yeah. If we had zero children, we'd be partying, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd be like going on vacations and figuring out what to spend our money on. Because mm-hmm. I got friends like that and they got a lot of money, mm-hmm. you know? So we have an op- I mean, and like we can justify it to ourselves. And I think we do. I mean, like we would never like, we would never go back to zero or even like two or one, whatever. Mm-hmm. Our children are precious to us. Like you can't put, they're not fungible. Yep. They're not, they're not fungible units. They are what the whole idea is about. So let's just set that like, you know, idealistic part aside. Um, the people that enjoy the life of, of maximal production so that they can individually consume and do not reproduce the next generation, that ethos will not reproduce to the next generation vertically. Yeah. Right. And so what you're saying is like, well, I mean, like, well, what if, uh, our children horizontally are influenced. I mean, that could happen too. But the reality is when any, within any given society, the people who have children, for whatever reason, their personality, their beliefs, et cetera, they will be the future generations. Okay? True. The future and, is, the future so belongs the future will to adapt. up for it. The future will adapt. Now, 
you could also say something like, well, the people that are doing the most innovation are the childless. And so when you have a situation where everyone is having children, there will be no innovation. And then eventually the population will increase to the point where we go Malthusian again. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, that's something that you could say. But all I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, Russia went through a huge population crash after the fall of communism because the society was under such shock. Yeah. And they, um, communism was bad. And I kind of hate communism. And I wish people would talk about communists like we talk about Nazis because it was responsible for tens of millions of deaths, you know. Yeah. But um, capitalism that Russia was subjected to, like the kleptocracy, yeah. uh, that was. The, the the birth rate dropped by like 50 percent or something like within like five years right like it was a dying society it's kind of bounced back now partly because it's figured out different things and we might not like putin and like the new russia but it's a stable society people need first thing people need is a stable society right they're dem they're quote democratic society in the 1990s which was really run by oligarchs mm -hmm. was not a stable society right yeah, so uh, you know we are going through a period where there's like population decline in huge parts of the world. But as you were saying, like groups like Amish are having huge population increases. What happens is um, when we think of an aggregate total fertility decline, that masks the fact that there is substructure within a society. Yeah. So over time, every successive generation is going to be from the subgroup that has a higher fertility for cultural reasons. Usually it's cultural reasons because fertility has swung so fast. Um, there are some genetic reasons between differences in fertility but that's probably not affecting any of this because yeah. fertility has crashed so fast in so many societies and sometimes bounced back up so fast that obviously there's like cultural incentives that are going on here mm -hmm. like the baby boom and then mm -hmm. the baby bust and stuff like that that um in the future it'll be the people that value having children and that value foregoing pure hedonic consumption in like some short-term like you know sensory manner um that are going to inherit, you know, inherit the future, I guess, is the way I would say. Also, another thing is, like, you know, like you're talking about, like, uh, movement and just, like, you know, interacting on waterfalls. We have a problem in America that everybody knows about helicopter parents, an overly legalistic state where, you know, you get prosecuted if you don't pay attention to your children when they're down the street. Um, even parents, even even families and parents, like, like, my, like you know, like my, my family, like, you know, my wife and I, we oppose this, and yet the social norms are so strong, you don't want people glaring at you and like thinking your kid is lost, so you have to kind of keep them in check. So there's a, this like stable state that everybody kind of hates, actually, mm -hmm. and it's totally irrational, but it's like it's the social norm, right? Um, eventually, people are just gonna say enough, you know, yeah. and it'll change. That's well, basically like we just have to wait, it's a non linear system, <laughs> right? Now, it's in a stable state. But eventually people will just say, you know what, this is ridiculous. Um, you know, people used, kids used to walk to school. I think the problem with that attitude that, uh, I mean, like, I don't think it's a problem specifically to this, like kids walking to school problem, but the problem with the attitude that like, we're stuck in a bad stable state, it'll just change eventually because people will get fed up is that if you let pressure in the system build up for too long, then you 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 get a massive revolution instead of a shift and those yeah. massive revolutions tend to be really costly that's 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 the communism problem that's the bullshit it's like an earthquake yeah so it's like you want to you want to you want to you want to make small changes intelligently regularly yeah this is kind of the, the Nassim Talib idea right like you want to you want to create a system that has small uh, small problems that happen regularly yeah, because if you don't gradual. have that, then you're gonna you're gonna run into the cliff. It's gonna shatter. Yeah, the, gonna the social shatter. social society society will shatter. Yeah, I mean, but I think like a lot of the things that you're pointing to are of a piece with the regimentation, um, commoditization. I sound like Adorno or somebody, um, which I don't mean to, but the cultural Marxist, you know, critique oh, yeah. of modern society and capitalism and how it's not really free and. I mean, there's something to that, but I mean, the issue is like, well, what's the alternative? I don't see a better alternative right now. When there is a better alternative, we'll go to it. Well, that, that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to, to comprehend, right? This is maybe the project, right? My project is really about movement and how movement helps us kind of like recover a lot of these things that we value. When people come to my workshops and they are with a tribe of people for a week, jumping around and climbing trees and having saunas like uh -huh. they feel all those things that 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 this society isn't giving them and 
And I think that that's just kind of like part of this broader worldview of like, what, what are the central aspects of human life that produce value for us? Yeah. That we need to kind of like, that perhaps we never articulated properly in the past and we need to be able to, to extract out and keep those as principles so that they don't get, they don't keep, keep getting sort of tossed out in the cultural update. I think, I don't know if there's a solution to the problem of this exponential change. I think it might just wipe us out. Like if it, if it goes to AGI, it just might, we just might not exist. But if there is a solution, it seems to me that it, it, it lies in being able to more effectively extract the most important principles from cultural technologies of the past. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I'm interested in having this conversation with you, because I know that you're, you really, you dive deep into, um, you know, Greek philosophy and Chinese philosophy to try yes. and kind of ask this question, yeah, how to live the good life. We have not, we have not progressed any further. We are still having the same arguments that they have, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you read them, it's like, okay, Okay, you got it. Yeah. Um, okay, I think I saw this on TV the other day, but you know, and I think I uh, Stephen Pinker's wife, uh, Rebecca, um, uh, old uh, Rebecca Goldstein. Goldstein. She wrote a book about Plato. I'm not, I'm going to be totally honest. Like, I thought the book was a little much and a little precious, but it was basically about what Plato can teach us. Mm-hmm. I think the idea though is good in terms of yeah, there's, there's a lot Plato can teach us. He he can te- he doesn't need to him and. Plato and Aristotle don't need to teach us about slavery. There are certain things that we've learned that they don't, you know, they, they weren't perfect. But I mean, if you, really, um, you know, I like Chinese philosophy in part because that's considered alien to yeah. our culture. And yet you, you look at their arguments, you're like, oh, I see that. I hear that. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's like, there's, there is a, evolutionary psychology is correct in that there's a common human nature yeah. about like certain impulses and certain debates that we've always had. There've always been people uh, like the, you know, French revolutionary and to lesser extent, the lady of the communists as well, where, they just want to strip away culture of all of its, uh, you know, just extraneous, useless things, yeah. right? But the Chinese had this debate thousands of years ago, and when it was tried, they realized this is not workable. There's a reason we waste waste time on music. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, that's because I mean, the music is part of the point of life. That's what they realized. You know, yeah. so um, the, and like the ancient Greeks had like you know societies like Sparta that lasted for centuries. But when you look at what the Spartans were, they were so one-dimensional in their competency and their virtuosity that you, you realize, you know, like they didn't have, we don't like know anything about Spartan philosophy because they didn't have Spartan philosophy. Mm-hmm. You know, they did pretty well at the Olympic Games and they were really good soldiers. Yep. And they also didn't work because uh, they had a hell of a slave class <laughs> that did everything for them. Yeah, it's the most know? egalitarian culture in uh, in. <laughs> in human history uh, or uh, like civilized history because it was also the most unequal. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it was a total communist system among the oligarch, mm-hmm. among the free, the free, the free citizenry. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah. I mean, I think we do need to look at the past. You look at the past, you say we have the same argument. The main thing is the exponential that you're talking about. I think that a lot of the philosophies that emerged 2,500 years ago during the axial age emerged because that was a time of cultural and technological change. Yeah. The Iron Age was just ripening. Mm-hmm. Iron changed a lot of things in terms of the means of production because it was a cheap metal and it democratized metal. Um, you wouldn't necessarily use copper because it was too soft for a lot of agricultural tools, I think. Bronze was expensive. Yeah. Bronze is for killing people. It's for weapons. Yeah, yeah. Iron is, is for everything. And so all of a sudden you had this um, new society where you know, even a peasant might have an iron tool yeah, you to can have- like things you know so you had all these changes a sort of egalitarian revolution in a way because you had you know like the hebrew ideas of you know everyone having some sort of dignity in the face of, you know god and the greeks like believed in some sort of democracy within the you know hebrews were the same within their own in group eventually this was expanded out you know mm-hmm. the chinese too but i mean it's because of these technological changes maybe we need to go through another sort of axial age i'm not seeing it i'm not seeing that we actually because we're still the same biology we're still the same cognitive hardware Mm -hmm. and so that i think that's one reason why we haven't like really created a new religion since islam a world religion and in fact islam's like let's be honest not that different than judaism and christianity like really we haven't created a new type of like you know religious meme for like two thousand years yeah you know, Christianity took the Hebrew ideas, merged it with the Greek ideas, got this new thing, you know, and then in the East, you had Buddhism, 
out of Hinduism. Like those were new things. And then it's just, it's kind of been the same since then. And maybe it's because like the cognitive hardware just, it doesn't allow for too many other variations and it's a pretty good adaptive match to what people find plausible and good. And so that works. Um, in terms of what you're interested in, like I will tell you since the last time we, we, we talked, um, I did go through a phase and I'm trying to go back into it of working out a lot of running a lot of yeah, lifting, yeah. you know, and like just working my body. And I can tell you when I was like, and you know, I'm not like totally out of shape, but compared to what I was two years ago before I started working really hard in the startup world, you know, like having a physically fit body move that you move through in the world is different than having a regular American middle-class office body. Anybody who's been physically fit knows that. Yeah. I mean, Sorry, the, I, I, I've meant to, to make this point, but we have the, we have the, the solution of, of affluence, but then nobody's hungry or people don't really need to be hungry in, in the Western world and, and, and increasingly everywhere else. And people, metabolically, you know, it probably is best that you are hungry. That's the reason intermittent fasting is coming in yeah. into vogue. Yeah, some, some hunger is probably not bad for you. Um, people don't need to be cold. They don't need to really... Like they, there's far less like infectious disease. All these things are great for us. Like, like I really think about as a parent, like, would you want to go back to a world with the levels of child mortality that were typical of every society prior to ours? Wow. But right now in the West, depression is increasing, anxiety is decreasing and suicide is depre- uh, increasing. And we have this political divisiveness that is, that is, that is just getting more and more virulent and destructive. Um, and so I think there's, there's this central problem that we need to face, which is this, this, I think that it's driven by the same thing. The same thing that's making things so great is making us miserable. Yeah. Well, okay, this goes back to what we were talking about, evolution and te- yeah. you know, teleology, telos. Um, and uh, I think the Greeks had like what? Like they had like uh, telos and techni. Yeah. Techni is uh, just like kind of like science, art, art, artifacts, engineering, you know? And mm-hmm. telos is like what the ultimate purpose of something is. Yeah. Um, I, our purpose as like, you know, let's like speak, speak for me, like middle to upper middle class, whatever American, and you know, you as well, is make money to pay the bills, pay the mortgage and buy stuff, you know, and our kids are inculcated that, you know, like they need more books. My kids need more books. They need more Kindles. You know, they need like more gadgets. Um, they need expensive, but they have like my three-year-old has a more expensive bike than I ever had when I was a child. And well, I, I did that because, like, you know, I just I want the best, quote unquote, best for them. Yeah. Well, if we go back to that idea that capitalism is a is an intelligence in some sense, like a distributed intelligence, like an ant colony that is oriented towards the production of goods. Yeah. Essentially, what you're describing is the behavior of an ideal, um, ideal cog in that system. Yeah. Yeah. We are. We are. We are cogs. We are. Uh, yeah, we're, we're widgets, you know, like we're just, we're, we're, we're not like, we don't have an, ind- we think we have an independent existence, but we're on the treadmill. That's basically what you're saying. We're on a hedonic treadmill yeah. and we don't have any long-term purpose. We're at the short-term optimum, right? So like our lifestyles are kind of like clutches, like in terms of, oh, well, next year we're going to like appreciate the finer things in life, but next year there's a new iPhone X27 or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. I know you're like, you kind of like, you, you view Peterson as sort of like just a, just a popularizer of the, the insights of, uh, of, of the past. Yeah, um, I do. But, but I think he's got something really, I think I, I, I tend, I'm both skeptical, but also very uh, fascinated by his idea that, that this, this destabilization of the religious framework of the West has given rise to this tendency towards ideological possession. Um, I would really, yeah. Well, I mean, I think the idea is like, um, if like supernatural religion declines, cause this is not just a Peterson idea, yeah. supernatural religion declines, political religion will arise. Some yeah. of the, I mean, I'm going to be totally honest. Like some of the most intolerant, oppressive, puritanical, annoying, obnoxious, inhuman, um, just, you know what I'm saying? Are left wing atheists. Yeah. Yeah. They are the most annoying fucking people sometimes. And I speak as someone who probably most of my friends, most people I'm close to are probably left wing atheists. Now, most of them, if they're friends with me, they're not the most puritanical idiotic mm-hmm. sort. Yeah. And you froze. You there?
Hey. Oh, man. It's the audio thing now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I cannot hear you. Now you can. Oh, I can hear you now. All right, so I need to go in 10 minutes, just so okay. you know. Yeah. All right. So what I was going to say, though, is, um, yeah, I mean, obviously there is a problem in that. And, like, you know, not to pick on left-wing secular people, but, the, you know, there's a suburban – a suburban upper middle class Republican voting person who like, you know, the aim of their life is to have the biggest disgusting McMansion mm -hmm. and the biggest disgusting SUV that they actually don't use in all terrain. You know, I mean, they're also, it's like, it's, it's, it's bling and signaling. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I have a real hard time with the, the SJW crowd too, but I think that they're not the only example Current yeah. of sort they're of symptoms. Ideology. They're not the cause. Right. Like I think that uh like I th I tend I would say that I tend more towards libertarianism on a lot of issues than maybe some of the other polls. But yeah. I meet a lot of libertarians who seem to worship the market as a kind of god and expect yeah. it to be able to fix everything and be utterly irrational about it in the same way that the SJWs are about, you know, diversity is always the greatest thing. Or another one that I recently run into is you, you recommended that I get involved in the rationalist community the last time we met. Yeah. Uh, I run into a lot of rationalists recently who like they worship reason. Like they've yeah. made reason their God. It's a fetish. And, it's a and, and it becomes, it becomes this weird recursive thing that they're yeah. stuck in and they, they can't kind of comprehend some well, you, you, you need to have like some axioms that are not reason to because that's just how it works yeah exactly. right and sometimes like rationalists they think they, they have a difficult time accepting that but i mean i still have to say at the end of the day um rationalists like they're much more reasonable than say sjw's or a lot of uh, a lot of materialistic types you know yeah, yeah which is I like mean, frankly, most americans are people of our class yeah you know like we're, we're stuck in the material world and that's why we get fat. That's why we don't, you know, do the outdoors, you know, even though we aspire to, that's why we don't have, we don't have time to work out, but we can Netflix binge. Yep. Yeah. You so, know? um, I feel like we're just really getting into this conversation about like where these values take us and what your, your background is in, on the philosophical stuff, but I know that you have to leave really soon. So I think that we should, uh, we should kind of like, just wrap it there. It's not the, the best stopping point, but it's going to be the stopping point for today. And, and maybe you can come back on the podcast and join me again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let, let, let's do a follow-up, bro. Okay. So uh, I'm going to, yeah.